what we've been trying to do is go through the New Testament, and today we're going to look at a letter called Titus. And it's one letter, three chapters, that Paul wrote. And so instead of just taking a verse here or a verse there, we're going to look at it as one complete letter, and we'll do it in one fell swoop. So we knock this out in one class, the letter to Titus. Let me start by telling you, our oldest daughter, we've got a son who's the oldest, then we have four daughters. Our oldest daughter, Gracie, she and her husband, JT, recently bought their first house. And when they bought it, they were so very excited, in part because as they bought that house, they had a chance to, to pack everything up, move all of the boxes, and get Becky, my marvelous wife, to come help them unpack. Now, Becky is the most organized person I've ever met in my life. She is a machine. She was put on this earth to unpack. <laughs> she has that gift. I'll give you her private cell number in case you're moving. You want it. Because she can, go, she can spend a couple of days there, and in just a couple of days, she'll have it with every fork in the right place, in the right drawer. It's an amazing gift. Uh, when she, she is also a lawyer and, and hasn't practiced law formally for many, many years with the kids, but she, she had that same skill in law. And so she went there with Gracie. The two of them had a great time. She got them unpacked last week in a, in a great degree and things put up. Now, I've tried to find out what my wife's secret is because I'd like that skill set. I don't really have it. I tend to get too bored too quick. I open up a box. I see forks. I'll put one or two up, but then I try to see what I can build with them. And I get kind of distracted, and I get kind of lost. And then I think, you know, this fork would do really well with some food. And then I'll get some food, and I'll use the fork. It's just a different skill set. And I think one of the things that makes Becky so good is she keeps to-do lists. And just about every morning, you'll find her after her quiet time with her cup of coffee and her to-do list. And it'll be things she has to do today, things she needs to do this week, things she needs to do this year. And she moves through them, and she crosses them off. And if from yesterday she had something undone, she puts it back on the list. It's, it's, it's an incredible thing to watch. I don't know. Maybe you're that way. How many of you are list people? A lot of you are list people. Okay, list people get a lot of stuff done. And it's made me wonder, and I really believe there are list people. There are just people who operate off list. And I, I really was curious. This is where I'd love to know how ancient history unfolds. Back before there was ready availability of cheap paper and pens, what were the list people doing? I mean, when you had to buy papyrus and it was running a buck fifty a sheet, when your pen was pulling some quill out of a goose, shaving the end off and finding some kind of ink, I mean, just what would my wife's life have been like? It would have taken her till noon just to get her to-do list. I don't know how it was done, but somewhere it was being done. Maybe they were mental lists. But there were to-do people because I'm convinced Paul's one of them, and I'm convinced Titus was one. Paul writes this letter to Titus, and the letter itself is basically just a to-do list. Titus, here are the things you got to do. Bam, 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 bam. And he lays it out there. So I want to talk about it, and I think the best way to do it first is to talk a little bit about Titus. Now, we don't know that that's what he really looked like. Rembrandt painted that, so he's about 1,500 years a little late to know. But it was a good picture, and Rembrandt was a good artist, so I just threw it up there. Who was Titus? Here's the question. We know about Titus from a number of different places in the New Testament. When we read about him, especially in Galatians and Corinthians, when we read about him, we learn that Titus was an uncircumcised Greek convert 
Paul converted him, and then Titus traveled with Paul. And Titus became what I would call Paul's get-or-done guy. Paul could just say, here's what I need, get her done. And he could leave, and Titus would get her done. I suspect most anybody who has success in this world is either a get-or-done get kind of person or has get-or-done people that work with them. I've got some marvelous people that work with me who are get-or-done kind of people. And I say, here's what I need, here's when I need it, and it's done. And it's done right. That's the kind of person Titus was. Titus could get the job done. So, for example, let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And the Corinthian church was a church that had all sorts of problems. Man, they were split. They were divided. They'd fight over everything. They couldn't get along. Everybody was, was in their own little cliques. He had lots of problems. They had these people come in who thought they were super saints. And, and Paul's really trying mightily hard to deal with these problems, recognizing Paul's not in Corinth. He's having to do it through letters and through get-or-done people. So we see in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 where Paul says, We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that's been given among the churches um, in Macedonia. In a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and extreme poverty have overflowed. They've done all of these marvelous things. And they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us. Accordingly, we urged Titus that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. We need him to come in and grow you up to act a little bit better like the rest of these churches. He continues later on in this chapter, verse 16. There we go. Thanks be to God who put into the heart of Titus the same earnest care that I have for you. He not only accepted our request and our appeal, but being himself very earnest, he's going to you of his own accord. He saw the need and he would have done it on his own if we hadn't asked him to. Now with him, we're sending the brother who's famous for his preaching. Not only that, he's been appointed by the churches to travel with us as we carry out this act of grace. He continues down in the bottom, as for Titus, he's my partner. He's my fellow worker for your benefit. This is who Titus was. He's someone that Paul really trusted, that Paul really used. He was an integral part. And isn't it nice then to have this letter that Paul sends to Titus? Before we look at the letter, one more thing we need to know. Where was Titus? Titus is on an island in the Mediterranean called Crete. It was called Crete then. It's still called Crete today. And so he is on the island of Crete. It's a long island. It's got beautiful beaches. It's got beautiful water. It's got inland mountains and hills. There were lots of towns and villages throughout Crete. Crete itself had a reputation. Epimenides was a Greek poet philosopher who was born in Crete moved up to Greece and said Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, and lazy gluttons. Now you might think, well, that wasn't very nice of him. Maybe that was their reputation, but it probably left. You know, I mean, reputations come and go, ha -ha. Epimenides wrote that 600 years before Paul. And it was still around as a saying by the time of Paul. So for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, the saying all over the Mediterranean world were Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, and lazy gluttons. That's where, Timothy, uh, where Titus is. And Titus is working at the churches in all of the little villages in Crete. Paul left him there for a reason. So now I want us to take the next 30 minutes 
and let's look at this letter. It gives us about 10 minutes a chapter. Let's look at the letter and let's go together. The start of it is a rather unusual introduction for Paul. Paul's letters almost always, except for, for Romans and this, almost always start the same basic way. But this letter has a little bit different introduction, so it's worth us looking at a little more carefully. The letter begins, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect, and their knowledge of the truth which accords with godliness. Now, I want to pause for a moment. When I say this is unusual, usually Paul will say something like, Paul, a bond servant or a slave to Christ, to the church at Philippians, to the church in Galatia, to the church at Corinth. It's like a form that Paul uses, from me to you. It's like email almost. You do the from, you do the to. Then you do the subject line. This is an email that got all messed up. Paul gives the from, but before he gives the to, he goes through this long statement here. So it's from Paul, a servant and apostle, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of truth. I think what Paul's telling Titus is, Titus, I'm going to give you a to-do list that you need to be doing for these churches. But you need to know that that's what we're all about. We are all about trying to figure out God's to-do list for our life. It's not our to-do list. It's his to-do list that we want to do. If we're doing our list and our list is different than God's list for us, then we need to tear our list up or edit it to be the same as God's to-do list for us. So he's saying, the whole reason I'm doing this is for the sake of the faith of God's elect and for their knowledge of truth, which accords with godliness. In hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies promised before the ages began and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I've been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. Finally, to Titus. But you see that insert. Now nestled in that insert, um, for those of you who weren't in here in the fall, I taught a, a life group Greek class in here where we looked at the Greek language and how it helps us understand some things in the New Testament. There are two words here that we can't quite see or related, but they're marvelous words that Paul's making a play on. This God promised before the ages began, it actually means before time eternal. And the word time there that's translated ages, let's see if we can do this, is um, um, a special Greek word. It is the Greek word chronos. Chronos in the Greek, which is, we would do it C-H-R-O-N-O -O with the ending of an S. We get chro chrono things from it, chronology, uh, uh, chronoscope, uh, you know, all of the chrono words come from that Greek word chronos, which means time. It's talking about general time, a time span. So before general time began, before this, the ages began, and at the proper time, that word time is a different Greek word for time. That is a Greek word that is not referencing the general idea of time. It's the Greek word kairos. Um, but it is a word, we can write it this way in English, kairos. Kairos in the Greek. <clears throat> it's referencing a chosen moment. A deliberate time. Such a time as this. That turning point or that that called out moment so Paul's saying here before any of time began God who never lies promised 
what at this moment in time we've seen manifested in his word through the preaching with which I've been entrusted. Paul starts this letter out saying, be sensitive to the moment in which you live. Because you live in a moment that's very, very precious and important. And you live in a moment where God is at work. He's been working from before time began, but in a very special, deliberate way, we're seeing that happening right now. And that's true for all of the ages. That's true for all of us in here, regardless of where we are in life. God has deliberate work right now. And you're at a moment in history where you uniquely can be there for God. So that's the way Paul begins. And then he says to Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he starts with qualifications for elders. He says, this is why I left you in Crete. I wanted you to put what remained into order. You got to get her done. Appoint elders in every town as I directed you. And here's how you pick out who's going to be the elders. They need to be above reproach. The husband of one wife. The children need to be believers and not just a bunch of drunken rebel rousers. That's Lubbock translation. Charge of debauchery or insubordination is like, they had British people somewhere translating that. In Lubbock, they just, look, you kids can't be a bunch of drunken rebel rousers. It's exactly what it means. For an overseer or an elder, as God's steward. See, the people who are looking after God's people are stewards. They're responsible to God. They're doing this for God. Needs to be above reproach. Shouldn't be arrogant. Shouldn't be quick-tempered. Shouldn't be a drunkard. Shouldn't be violent. Shouldn't be greedy. They ought to be hospitable. A lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, disciplined. This is what they need to be so that they can teach other people to be that way and stop folks from teaching people wrongly. Now there's a checklist, Titus. Go find those folks and put them in charge of the church. Let them be the teachers, the elders, the overseers, the deacons, the pastors, the people in the church that are trying to, to take care of, of the, and, and, and help God's moment in time in the lives of each person. Because there are lots of people that aren't that way. There are lots of people who are insubordinate, who are empty talkers. An empty talker is someone who talks but doesn't walk deceivers and they need to be silenced they're just doing nothing they teach for gain what they shouldn't teach one of the Cretans a prophet of their own we know Epimenides said Cretans are always liars evil beasts and lazy gluttons now he'd said it 600 years earlier but that saying was still around at the time of Paul so Paul if we go back to the Elmo I mean, to the uh, uh, PowerPoint. So Paul is here, and he's laying it out for these people. And he says, he says uh, uh, to, to Timothy, he says, I want you to appoint these elders, and here's who they need to be, and here's what they need to do. Now, chapter 2, we roll into chapter 2, and here we see the to-do list for older men, older women, young women, young men, and workers. Now, I got a question for you. How many of you fit at least one of those categories? Older men, older women, young women, young women, and workers. Now, did you see the diplomatic way I did not divide that up? How many of you are older women versus younger women? That is pretty diplomatic. Paul doesn't ask them to raise hands. He simply says it. But you know where you fit. And if you don't know, you'll know when you look at the to-do list. Because this to-do list is for us who are older men, older women, young women, young men, and workers. Titus chapter 2. As for you, Titus, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men. Older men are to be 
sober-minded. They're to be dignified. They're to be self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and sound in steadfastness. All right, I got my list. Older women. Older women, likewise. They should be reverent in their behavior. Not slanderers. Not slaves to much wine. They should teach what is good. And so train the young women. Older women train the younger women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be self-controlled. Hey, that's the same thing we old men have to do. To be self-controlled, to be pure, um, working at home. Now, by the way, I am not one of these people, and I'm just being honest with you, who reads this and says women should be at home working. Some women should be at home working. Some women should not be. Some men should be at home working. Some men should not be. But Paul is writing at a time where women certainly are responsible for their homes even if they've got others who are helping them do them. They oversaw the home. And so Paul writes in this way. Now, that is a magnificent thing for women to do. But if you're a single father, you've got you got a lot on your shoulders. If you're a single mom, you've got a lot on your shoulders. And we live in a very tough culture. But there is something very admirable about women making sure the home's taken care of. i got to tell you, even when Becky is working outside the home, she still takes care of the home in a marvelous way. Now, I try to take care of the home too, but, but she, she's la hefa. Women are to be kind, submissive to their own husbands. Now again, this is, and, and we need to have a class on some of this because I really want to explain it. It's a beautiful relationship, the way God teaches the dynamic between husbands and wives. But that's a mutual submission between the two. And the husband's responsible for the leadership in that in the sense that the husband needs to show respect and accord and, and in a sense submission to his wife uh, uh, as a leader who's responsible for demonstrating it at first. This is the way Paul writes it here and we can go into more detail later. But We've got to keep through the flow of the class. Do this that the word of God might not may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Boy, you're getting a, oops, thank you. Urge the younger men to be self-controlled. You're getting a Getting a theme there. All of them, self-controlled. Show yourselves in all respects to be a model of good works. In your teaching, show integrity. Show dignity. Sound speech that cannot be condemned. So an opponent may be put to shame and, and won't have anything evil to say about us. Now, bond servants. This is a tough passage, especially on MLK weekend. Because bond servants can also be translated slave. It's the word doulos in the Greek. But the idea of what's talked about in New Testament slavery is very, 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 very different than the horrific, horrific um, uh, slavery that existed in America and in other places. And we should never read this as Paul condoning slavery. That's not a fair reading of the passage. This is Paul speaking into an economic system that's very different than the system that we have today. And I really think this is much better understood as workers. Because back then, the slave class was a working class. But it was not one in the sense that we had slaves in America. And if we read this wrongly, it's, it's doing a great disservice to God and to Scripture. Because God and Paul make it very clear in Jesus Christ there is no slave nor free. There's no male nor female. There's no Greek. There's no Jew. There is no rich. There's no poor. There's no uh, uh, um, popular, unpopular. In Jesus Christ, there, 
is only one group of people, those who are saved. And that's the only group. And so we've got to be really careful here. I want us, in the short time I've got to go through this letter, to consider this as people in a marketplace. They're to be submissive in everything. Again, you've got to take this. We, I don't want to digress too much, but we have a real problem when we read some of these passages. We have a problem because we think like 21st century people who all took math and science. You may not be a math and science person. You may be a total anti-math geek. But it doesn't matter, you still took it. And so we read these words like, in everything, in Greek, all things. And we think, well, he said everything. So technically, if my employer tells me to lie, I better lie. No. That's not what everything meant in the Greek. Everything didn't mean this scientific concept of every atom and molecule. Everything meant the reasonable group that you can imply from this, that you can or infer from this, excuse me. It's the reasonable group. You know, when, when it says that all of Jerusalem went out to be baptized by John the Baptist, it did not mean the high priest and everybody, Jew, Gentile, Pilate. No, it just meant all of them within a group the reasonable group that you can expect from that. This just means within that reasonable group, we are to honor the people we work for. If, if my boss tells me to, to do this task, my responsibility is to do that task and to do it well. That's a testimony to God, to be well-pleasing as opposed to argumentative. You really want me to do that? That's a stupid waste of my time. Not pilfering. Um, what was the TV show? There was a TV show, um, uh, King of Queens. Do you remember that show? I remember that show because there was an episode where the wife was going to set up a home office. And it was going to cost a lot of money to do it. It was like $4,000. And the husband is, why are you doing that? that? What a waste of money. And she says, well, it's going to cost that much. He says, how can it cost that much? I can fix this room up. She says, well, there are supplies and things like that. Well, you can steal those from work. All right. Pilfering. No, no, no. That's not the way we ought to do it. So within the framework of this, how am I doing time-wise? Uh, yeah. Okay. This is a really good verse. I want to pause for a minute. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. This passage, the grace of God has appeared. If you were reading it in the Greek, if we go to the PowerPoint for a moment, the Greek is fantastic on this passage. I was, I was reading it uh, uh, this week, getting ready for class. Um, here's, here it is in the Greek. Now, some of you in this class have learned a little bit of Greek, so we just threw it up there. If you don't know Greek, just say, that's Greek to me. You'll be fine. Um, epiphane um, means it appeared. Okay, so he starts out with that emphasis. It appeared. And it makes you wonder, what? What appeared? It appeared. Ignore the gar, that uh, next word. It just means for. It's just one of these little words that Greek throws in all the time that generally you can ignore. For it appeared, the caries, the grace, the gift. That word caries means grace. It means gift. Think the charismatics or the people who are real into the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, caries means grace or gift, gift in the sense of something you did not deserve. It appeared, the grace or gift to Theu, of God. So Tyrios is an adjective. Okay, some of you don't even remember what an adjective is. That's okay, they describe nouns, all right? So you might want to say, it appeared, the saving grace gift of God. No, 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 no. In Greek, this would be called a predicate adjective. It appears in a place where you, subs you insert the, a linking verb that's just left out like is. So here's what you get out of this. It appeared, 
the grace of God that's saving, that is saving all people. Again, all meaning all within a group. The gift of God that is saving all people appeared at this moment, Kairos, in this moment, this particular place, in this particular time. This is one of the clearest passages that teaches Paul doesn't use this word grace of God simply to refer to God's graciousness. Paul's referring to a historical event. You want to know what the gift of God is that saves you and me? It's Jesus Christ crucified on our behalf. That's what takes away our sins. That's the atoning sacrifice. That is, it appeared. Jesus Christ died. The, 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 the gift of God appeared. It, 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 it epiphanied. It came. He came. That it appeared can also be translated, he appeared. He appeared. The gift of God that is saving all people. The cross of Jesus Christ appeared. If we go back to the power or to the uh, Elmo, and look what happened. For the grace of God, the gift of God has appeared. It appeared. He appeared. Bringing salvation for all people is the way they translate it. Training us to renounce ungodliness. Training us to renounce worldly passions. Training us to live self-controlled. Training us to live upright. Training us to live godly lives in the present age. Waiting for the blessed hope of Him appearing again. So what Paul is driving at here is, is it all starts with the cross of Christ. It not only saves us, it trains us. i got to tell you something. I've been emailing back and forth with a, a, an atheist up in Canada who read my book. And, and he, he first wrote the law firm, and he said, I'm sure Mark will never respond to this. You know, he just went to the law firm internet website. But I read his book, and I think it's really stupid. And, and I think it's got all of these problems. And I just want to say that uh, uh, I think it's a, a, a really poor effort and, and has major holes in its logic. And when those anonymous emails come in, not anonymous, but those emails come in to the firm itself, if I'm mentioned in it, it gets sent to me. So I get it. So I emailed him back. I said, hi, I'm Mark. I really like the book. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, if I'd known anybody was going to read it, I could have done a better job writing it. But I'm really interested. Where do you think I blew it? And he wrote back and he said, well, I, I never really thought you'd even read the book. Uh, and I said, no, no, no. And I struck up a marvelous conversation. I'm not through with it yet with this gentleman whose first name happens to also be Mark. And, uh, um, uh, and, and he's got a lot of very thoughtful, good questions and arguments that are worthy of being inspected and looked at. But I, I, I look at it and, and, and I think, you know, it is the grace of Jesus, it is the gift of Jesus that changes who I am. One of the things he said to me was, just try for five minutes to live as if there's no God. And I told him, I could sooner try for five minutes to live as if there's no oxygen. I mean, I can't do it. It's just not in me. He said, you'd be the same person you are now. I said, no, I would not. If there was no Jesus and he wasn't Lord of my life, I would be radically different. And I would be. Because the truth of who Jesus is and what he's done changes who I am and how I want to live. It really does. And it does for all of us. And that's what Paul's saying here. He's saying that the grace of God appeared not just to save you, but to help change you, to help transform you, so that you're not just who you are.
if we go back to the PowerPoint. So we're there, you're there. So that's chapter two. Grace changes everything. Jesus on the cross. Then we roll into chapter three, and chapter three has this really solid to-do list. The first three verses, if we go to those, please. Remind them, these are those Cretans, the lying, evil, lazy gluttons. Remind them, be submissive to their rulers and to authorities. Be obedient. Be ready for every good work. Don't speak evil of anyone. Avoid quarreling. Be gentle. Show perfect courtesy to all people. See, we used to be different people. We used to be foolish and disobedient and led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures. We used to pass our days in malice and envy. We would be hated by others and we'd hate each other. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God, when the grace of Jesus Christ, when the death of Christ on our behalf, that ultimate act of love and care, when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared. He saved us. Not because we were worthy. Not because of works done by righteousness. But because He's merciful. Because of the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Larry Burgess sent me an email this week that had a quote from Bono of the group U2. It's a tremendous quote. Bono says, karma exists. Karma's in the world. You reap what you sow. You do good, it comes back good. You do bad, it comes back bad. But if it was all karma, we'd all be in deep doo-doo. <laughs> Thankfully, in addition to karma, there's another something at work in the universe. It's called grace and mercy. And there's a God who says, I'm going to set aside karma for you because of my mercy and I'm going to give you grace and I'll have to do it because there is such a thing as karma the evil's got to be paid for but I'll pay the price I'll do the bad on the karma and that's what the cross is and so we have it here that he's by his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration, a renewal, a rebirth of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, it's the same word, by that gift, by that moment in history, being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things so that those who've believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. We don't do it to get saved. We do it because we understand what he saved us from. Uh, there is a very important P.S. in this letter. P.S. Do your best to speed Zenos the lawyer on their way. It's like one of my favorite verses in the Bible. I just don't understand why they didn't, they didn't put lawyer in bold or all caps. We'll go back. So that's the letter. Everything we do, we do, and it's based on grace. Here is um, his final to-do list that we just went through. We went through it that way, so I'll just add the P.S. and get caught up. Here are your points for home. Point for home number one, trust. I'm going to work this week really hard on trusting God. And I'm going to claim what Paul said in Titus 1, because I know this is true. I can trust God because God, who never lies, has promised. And I can trust in his promises. Second point for home for me is a do point. Paul told Titus to put what remained into order. I'm going to get after it. I'm going to get after it, and I'm going to make the changes that need to be changed on the to-do list. Paul told Titus to remind the people to do things, and I took everything that Paul asked them to do or not do and put together the to-do list. So here in the last couple of minutes, I want the to-do list up there. This is Titus's to-do list. And I want to ask you this question. I've reproduced it on the back of your, your handout. I want to ask you this question. Do not do this in front of everybody right now. 
But ask yourself, if a third person who just walked and shadowed me, you can't just be like a third person who likes you or doesn't like you because they're going to be biased. Think, think straight. If there was a third person who shadowed me 24-7 for a month, which would they check off? Which boxes would they check off for me? And where these are good boxes, I'm going to say, thank you, Lord, because I'm sure it's from him. Where they're bad boxes, I'm going to say, help me, Lord. I want to change. I want to grow. I need to deal with my checklist. Arrogant, that's a bad one, by the way. Quick-tempered, drunkard, violent, greedy for gain. Those first five are all ones, if that box is going to be checked, then your to-do list and my to-do list is, let's start working on that. Let's prayerfully try to change who we are. Let God change who we are. Hospitable, lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, disciplined. Those are good ones. Then we hit another bad list. Insubordinate, empty talkers, deceivers, disobedient, unfit for good work, if those are checked, we don't want them. Knows God. Goes back to what Brent's going to be teaching on Wednesday night. The experiencing God is also knowing God. Know in the Greek word gnosis means a, 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 a knowledge is, is intimacy. It's the same word for sexual intimacy. It, it's, a, it's, it's a very intimate awareness. Sober-minded, dignified, sound in faith, sound in love, steadfast, reverent, moderate in drinking, teaches good things, trains others in uprightness, pure, kind, submissive to authority, integrity, dignity, sound in speech, honest and godly. Um, those are good things. We hit a bad one again. Argumentative, ready for every good work. That's a good one. Never speaking evil of anyone. Quarreler, uh -uh. courteous, yes. Foolish, uh -uh. slave to passion, uh -uh. Hated by others, hateful of others, divisive, useless. That's your checklist. So practically, ask yourself, where do I need to be thanking God for how he's worked in my life versus praying for his help to help change my life in those areas where I need it? Can I pronounce a blessing over you and, and uh, thank you, and I look forward to seeing you guys next week. Um, Father, I do ask your blessings on all who are listening to this message. Father, I ask you to bless them by speaking into their hearts and bringing conviction as only your spirit can. Conviction not only to the work that you have done in history that transforms humanity and draws us into fellowship with you, but also, Lord, for the fact that you don't leave us in the shoddy manner in which you found us. And so would you bless my brothers and sisters and friends here with, with a conviction that you can change who we are into who you want us to be. And we pray we will align ourselves with your will in that way. Through Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen.